Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roko Ramora, and I am the curatorial intern here in the Antiquities Department at the Getty Villa Museum, home of the Getty's collection of ancient Greek, Roman, and Etruscan art. Today's program is part of the Getty's Art Break program, in which we take inspiration from an object or several objects in the Getty's collection to encourage new conversations about ancient art and cultures. And today we're gonna to be look at um, Greek and Roman sculptures depicting the human body. And in this conversation, I am very pleased to welcome Mark Bradley, professor of classics at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Welcome. Um, hello everybody. Um, thank you Rocco for inviting me along to speak to you today. Of course. So let's get started. Uh, Mark and I are here to have a conversation about a topic that might at first appear a bit unusual, the aesthetics of body fat in ancient sculpture. And we're going to do so by focusing on two Roman sculptures, a marble statue of the goddess Venus and a small bronze statuette of Hercules. We're going to look at the way ancient sculptures have approached the depiction of body fat and of fleshiness more broadly. Both of these sculptural types were immensely popular in antiquity with dozens, if not hundreds of known um, examples. And as you can see from the prints uh, shown on screen, they are also popular in more recent centuries as well. So um, right off the bat, I think we'd like to emphasize that by, by body fat, we, we don't mean fat bodies, but rather um, what we mean is fleshiness. So basically the bits of your body you can grab hold of, whether it's um, flab, whether it's saggy skin, whether it's soft muscle. Um, so I, I guess a normal bit, a normal part of all of our bodies, big and small um, of all genders. Um, and in particular, we're looking at this topic as an artistic opportunity, um, an aspect of the human body that was available to ancient artists. Um, especially sculptors who were working three-dimensionally um, to exploit, to say something interesting about their subjects. And I think what's, what's even more interesting is that there's no right answer. Fat can mean lots of different things. Yes, I, thank you for saying that. And um, although our conversation today is going to be uh, rather brief, it's part of a larger Getty digital project called um, In the Flesh, Body Fat in Ancient Art, which um, is undertaken in collaboration with Google Arts and Culture. And we will leave a link to this digital exhibition uh, in the chat. And um, I encourage you to explore this multimedia presentation um, on Google's platform. So in developing this project, uh, Mark, I was very much inspired by your work on obesity and um, emaciation and corpulence in Roman art. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about um, your research and sort of what motivated you, um, what led you to this unusual topic. Yeah, sh sure, Rocco. Um, well, I suppose just to begin by saying that my um, research interests in the ancient world, I guess, are fueled by uh, what we might call a compare and contrast exercise. So how similar and how different were the Greeks and Romans from us? Um, and I'm, I think I'm, I'm interested in really basic components of human experience. My early research looked at how ancients perceived colour and smell and different senses and how that compared to modern sensory experience. And I got interested also in, in body shape, in body size, and the links that were drawn in antiquity and today to things like character, behavior, and, and morality. Um, I've just finished some uh, recent work on Roman noses, looking at how nose shape and nose size in antiquity influenced modern discussions about noses, but also about how modern approaches to noses departed from classical models. And about a decade or so ago, I got interested in fleshiness and slenderness and how the ancients interpreted it. Um, and I found that actually nobody had ever really looked at body fat in antiquity before. 
Um, and I remember spending a summer um, at the British School at Rome, wandering around the city's museums and galleries. And I was looking not at the um, idealised bodies of Apollo or Aphrodite, but at, at the busts of chubby senators hidden away in, in, in the corner of the museum, at images of comic actors wearing fat suits, at statues of emaciated old women. And it opened up um, a whole world of artistic interpretation that I just really never thought about before. Yeah, I think similar, like after reading your article, like once you start looking for it, you actually do see it more and more. Um, so to, to kind of return to the broader issue that, that we're discussing, for many people, body fat is not necessarily something that they connect with, with ancient bodies. And in fact, um, if they have an idea about what an ancient body looks like, it's probably more like the chiseled torso that um, you see on screen. So even museum goers, they might expect to see fuller figures, fleshier figures in paintings by Rembrandt or um, Rubens, but not so much in the ancient galleries. Why might that be the case? That's a good question, Rocco. Well, um, so it, it, it's sometimes argued that this ideal of classical bodily perfection, um, at least in male bodies, had its origins in a Greek man called Polycletus, who was a fifth century sculptor who wrote a manual about how to represent the ideal physique. And this manual, this, this um, idea was based on a system of mathematical equations that prioritized tautness, symmetry and balance. Um, and this, this model established by Polycletus was extremely far reaching. It had an enduring influence on figural art uh, across classical antiquity and beyond. Um, and, and this um, artistic ideal carried over into real life, as you can see in this quote um, by the ancient physician Galen, who said, neither the overweight nor the underweight body is in due proportion, but the body which equals the canon of Polycletus, that man I've just talked about, reaches the summit of complete symmetry. So what Galen's doing here is emphasising a connection between moderate appearance, moderate bodies and moderate behaviour. And this idea um, became, became a mainstay of ancient medicine uh, and ancient philosophical thinking about bodies, about identities, uh, about behaviours. Yeah, and that's sort of precisely what also made it a moral issue as well, this um, deep link that the Greeks and um, later on the Romans um, perceived between your uh, physical appearance and your inner behavior, your mind or your soul, um, however you want to call it, this link between a kind of outer beauty and inner beauty, you know, to, to oversimplify things a bit, a good man has a good body and balanced behavior leads to a balanced physique and vice versa. And one of the reasons why this link is, is important because it also functioned in the opposite um, direction as well. If you behave immoderately, then your body looks out of balance in a similar fashion. And on screen here, you see a kind of illustration of this principle in action on a Greek vase that shows actors uh, uh, acting in a comedy on a theater stage. And because in Greek comedy, they are playing um, characters who are very much behaving inappropriately in ways that you, you don't want to, you don't want the citizenry to emulate. The actors are driving this point across by wearing costumes that are essentially fat suits. And you can see, if you look closer, these really exaggerated, um, overly round bellies and buttocks and these kind of sagging breasts they're meant to be perceived as the extreme because they are in a way sort of emphasizing how unacceptable the behavior of the characters themselves is. And on, on the next slide, you can see um, a, a different kind of extreme. So um, on the left, 
uh, is Geras, and Geras is the personification of old age. He's the deity um, uh, who governs old age. He's normally de depicted in um, art, in vase paintings, in a mythical fist fight with the much beefier Hercules. Um, and thin bodies in ancient art could be um, negatively charged through associations with wasting with disease. And they could be bodies that um, uh, likewise could have fun poked at them. So um, I, I mean, what I would say is that while these are extremes, there are also numerous grey areas in which bodies of different sizes were not necessarily meant to be mocked. So many representations of satyrs, for example, and satyrs, these mythical half men, half goats, show these woodland deities in very relaxing, life affirming uh, um, ways. They, they, these were chubby bodies that I suppose were very much in place in their context. Um, we can conclude that there is no singular um, meaning, uh, singular cultural meaning to fatness in antiquity. The absence of a singular cultural position on body fat allowed artists to play with it creatively and sometimes provocatively. And this brings us to one of the main objects that we're looking at today. That's the crouching Venus, the crouching Aphrodite. So, Rocco, what, what do we know about this particular statue? Um, I, I very much love this object. It is it is a Roman statue um, that represents the Roman goddess uh, Venus, or Aphrodite, um, as she was known to the Greeks, um, in the act of taking a bath. And she is accompanied by her son, Cupid or, or Eros, who has um, unfortunately lost his head in, in this example. And she is shown crouching down. That's why the sort of uh, usual title of the crouching Aphrodite or crouching Venus. This particular statue has, has a fascinating um, ownership history. And we're going to leave a little link in the chat um, to an article that um, shares a bit more about how it sort of uh, made its way uh, to Los Angeles and to the Getty. For now, however, um, what is so striking for our purposes about this object is the way that the goddess's body is posed and positioned. And uh, you can see in these um, sort of views from all sides, just how much attention the sculptor has paid to the goddess's stomach. And it sort of extends even into sort of the positioning of the secondary char character of the Cupid who embraces the goddess in a way that draws the viewer's attention precisely to the softness of her belly. And you can even see um, in, in the corner how the sort of rolls of her stomach are rhyming visually, so to speak, with the armband that the goddess is wearing that is a kind of um, uh, a helical golden um, snake-shaped bracelet. Sculpting something like this took a lot of work. And today we are maybe a bit overly used to, to sort of a world of photography in which bodies are captured, um, you know, quote unquote, as they are. But um, an ancient sculptor like the one who uh, came up with this particular composition had to really sort of start from scratch in depicting the body. And this is something that your article um, emphasized uh, very much, that every aspect of a statue, we should take it to be motivated by a particular reason. And I 100% agree, especially if you consider how much work and time and money um, it took to produce a finely crafted object like this. So why would a sculptor want to go out of his way to depict the goddess in this particular pose and draw so much attention to the stomach? Well, I mean, I suppose the traditional answer is that the fleshy stomach alludes to female fertility, it alludes to the ability to survive um, and to procreate. So a little bit like those Paleolithic figurines of inflated female bodies that were found all across Europe. 
Um, but I do think there's something more going on here. So to, to an ancient viewer, seeing Aphrodite kneeling down like this, amplifying her fleshy folds, would be pushing the boundaries of what was essentially a cult statue. It's, it's kind of hard to imagine the effect. And on, on this next slide, you can see how different the crouching um, uh, Aphrodite, the crouching Venus, is from more usual ways of depicting the goddess, which were limited to a couple of relatively standardised standing types. So by contrast, um, our Aphrodite suddenly appears in a pose that is shocking precisely because it's so immediately and intuitively human and understandable. Um, and I think today it's difficult to imagine how something so seemingly banal, like a change in the way you're standing or crouching, might actually be transformative for viewers. It's not like people hadn't previously thought that Aphrodite was capable of crouching. But nevertheless, after centuries of seeing the goddess standing upright in a pose like the Aphrodite of Cnidos on your left, getting the same goddess to kneel down can make an enormous difference to what you're looking at. And it's not as simple as saying that it makes the goddess more relatable, but it does make her more lifelike. It suggests a very real relationship between skin, bone and flesh that you wouldn't normally associate with this goddess. Thank you um, so much for, for saying that. And um, in part, uh, precisely to complicate the sort of gendered um, aspects of, of understanding and discussing body fat, um, we can uh, switch lanes a little bit and look at our second object, which is a very different kind of fleshy body. Um, it is a bronze statuette of the hero Hercules. And if we compare it to the, the Crouching Venus, to sort of piggyback off what you were saying, if the Crouching Venus is an attempt by the sculptor to make the statue seem um, more like real life, in this particular type of Hercules, it's closer to a sculptor attempting to make the work seem more than real life, to be um, more than is actually humanly possible. His body is supposed to look um, almost impossibly heavy and muscular. And this uh, little bronze figurine is only about six inches tall, but we know that it replicates a type that is best known in really colossal um, replicas from the city of Rome and elsewhere, like the one that you see um, here in this early photograph. Now, the type in question, the sculptural type, is known in scholarship as the wary Hercules or the tired Hercules. Why is Hercules tired? Well, well let's look at the um, this little bronze figurine from all sides. So. This um, represents the Greek hero resting on a club after completing his 12th and final task. Um, he had to fetch some golden apples that belonged to Hera, which were kept in a garden guarded by nymphs called the Hesperides. He had to travel the world to find this garden. He had to fight off monsters. And this statuette depicts him exhausted with the apples in his right hand held behind his back. So here he's shattered, he's had enough, he's at the end of his tether. Yes, and um, once again, um, like in the case of the Venus, this is not the only way to represent Hercules. Um, in the actual mythological stories and the kind of um, lore around Hercules as a figure, he's always meant to be someone of, of superhuman strength, incredible endurance, incredible stamina, capable of all sorts of things that are impressive, but often in sort of artistic representations like this um, marble statue of Hercules, um, also from the Getty's collection, he is represented as what is essentially a, an athletic, muscular man, like a, an attainable kind of body. By contrast, if we look at the bronze statuette, Hercules is way more than simply muscular. Um, his body is shown with a kind of fleshiness that you could almost describe as, as engorged. And um, if we think back about sort of what the meaning of, of exaggeration was in those 
um, Greek uh, vases with comic actors. Can we be certain that some something like this, a kind of um, exaggerated physique like this, would have been interpreted as a positive thing? Well, um, as ever, Rocco, um, uh, it, it's hard to say. Um, uh, and, and in a sense, that's the point. So in antiquity, um, athletes that competed in heavy categories, such as boxing or various feats of strength, um, were frequently criticized precisely because of the extreme amount of food that their dietary regime required. They were literally meatheads. They required quantities of food and sleep that far overshot the moderate balance that was promoted by the Polyclitean ideal that we talked about earlier. Um, and in the case of um, Hercules specifically, opinions were divided. So on, on the one hand, some authors described him as an incredible glutton. So the Greek grammarian and author Athenaeus, for example, argues that Hercules' hunger was in, insatiable. He cites a quote from a play saying that if you should see Hercules eating, you would die. His gullet thunders inside, his jaw rattles, his molar crackles, his canine tooth gnashes, he sizzles at the nostrils, he waggles his ears. Uh, it's a great quote, isn't it? Uh, but you see, from this perspective, his exaggerated physique is once again a, a reflection, a proxy for his exaggerated behaviour. Others had the exact opposite opinion, rejecting the beefy artistic representations of Hercules as being um, unrealistic, disingenuous. So Dio Chrysostom, for example, says, Hercules did not look at all like any of these athletes, for where could he have penetrated had he carried so much flesh or required so much meat or sunk into such depths of sleep? No. He was alert and lean like a lion, keen of eye and ear, wrecking naught of cold and heat, having no use for bed, shawl or rug, clad in a dirty skin with an air of hunger about him. Yeah, I mean, in, in other words, he can't possibly be that beefy because you would only get that much flesh if you ate in the extreme. And to the ancients, a powerful muscular body that um, nevertheless required extreme amounts of food was still liable to the same kind of criticism that extreme behavior um, brings along. And that's what's so interesting from today's perspective, because today we tend to criticize, and I mean, we sort of as a general sort of society of, of the 21st century, we tend to criticize overeating mostly when it leads to fatness because we consider being muscular and being fat as these sort of two separate categories but the example of hercules shows us that the ancients had a very different um way of thinking about heavy bodies of all sorts it's almost in the case of hercules like the sculptor is asking you know, with respect to his his um his feet, is it worth it? How how powerful of a body is he at the end of the day? This exhausted hero. Sure, I, and, I, and I think all this shows us that um, well, fat is complicated, um, and it's impossible to tell a simple story about fat being beautiful or fat being ugly in ancient art. Fleshiness, um, though, is unusual. So we're used to seeing classical statues slim and beautifully proportioned, and so were the ancients. So whenever we see fat or thin bodies in ancient art, something's going on. Um, so body fat, in a sense, it was like a costume. Um, it transformed the meaning of the body. It was there precisely to get us thinking. I think we could we could really go on um, like this for, for a while, but. Um, at this point, it's probably uh, a good idea to, to see if we could answer um, some of our audience questions. And uh, I have a question here lined up that um, we could start with. Um, would an artist have perceived uh, body fat as, quote unquote, fat? 
Now, this is a, th that's a great question uh, because it sort of uh, it really depends on how we think of what the word fact means. Um, in many of today's languages, um, English included, we don't really think about flesh that much. Like today, the category of flesh, like meat in the human sense, is very rarely discussed outside of, you know, horror movies and um, sort of very specific considerations. Um, but in many of the ancient discourses, this idea between this sort of medical distinction between body fat in the kind of uh, sense of, you know, fat tissue and flesh in the sort of more general sense of muscles combined with, with fat tissue, especially, in, you know, in the example of, of Hercules, wouldn't have been that much of a, a societally recognized tradition, in part because simply the, the medical awareness of the population, including the, the artists, um, wasn't necessarily, um, or wasn't certainly as advanced as it is today. Now, would an artist consider it fat? The perfect place to look for that answer would be in Polycleitus's treatise. Unfortunately, we do not have it. And so we don't know exactly what, what they would think. I think that's a, that's a good answer. I mean, I think you know the point is actually that um, when an artist is is sculpting fat or flesh, it's something extra. It's stuff on top of a kind of basic prototype um, that they're working with, following the polycloitine ideal. But it's how you interpret that that makes it um, particularly interesting. Okay, so Stephanie. Um, has asked in the chat. So Mark, you mentioned making connections between ancient and modern slash contemporary ideas and ideals of body size and shape related to personality and moral characteristics. Have you encountered the field of fat studies as you've been doing this work? If you have, have you considered looking at the artwork you engage with through this lens. Um, and I think, Stephanie, I mean, I, 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 you know, I was reading what I could when I did this research because, I mean, there was so little based uh, on what fat and fleshiness meant in, in antiquity that I absolutely had to look at medieval, renaissance, early modern and modern depictions of, of fat. And there's, there's an enormous uh, quantity of really good material reflecting on what fat means and how the meaning of fat oscillates over, over time um, in, in different ways. And I think one, one thing that, um, one striking thing that emerged, me from, uh, emerged for me from looking at this research was this precise kind of ambiguity and ambivalence um, that, that placed in a particular cultural context, um, fat could mean lots of different things. It could mean multiple things at the same time. Um, uh, and, you know, and I think this idea that it, it, it functions, certainly in an artistic context, uh, like a costume, um, is, is absolutely applicable to, um, to what, what we're seeing in antiquity. So I think that's a really good question, and and the answer is yes. Probably not, you know, not in as many manifold ways as I ought to have done, but I, I, it was it was extremely instrumental in my research. Um, our next question uh, is is one that sort of connects to a lot of what we were already uh, mentioning. Uh, wasn't corpulence thought of as indicating that a person was well to do or rich? Um, yes and no. In a in a sort of simple literal sense there was like a logical connection between you know being able to eat more food and being able to afford more food and that sort of um stands true however the um the relationship between richness and um corpulence is one that was both positively and negatively charged and often it is the negative um kind of connotations of that um, connection that are brought up more commonly in the written sources. And this connection is one that is based often um, both in Greek and in Roman writing with sort of unease about um, certain kinds of wealth, material wealth, and how it is being used in a social setting. And so an overly rich person isn't by any means in antiquity um, something that is unquestionably positive. It is often something to fear, to be wary of, um, or, you know, in correlated sense to kind of 
um, shun ridicule um, and kind of other in many ways. And there, the connection between of kind of fattened appearance and a kind of um, fattened wallet, if you will, um, was one that could be uh, exploited to show the the immoderation of such a person. And there is a very interesting link that we could, you know, talk more about how that relates to kind of femininity and a lot of sexual um, behaviors and attitudes that are similarly kind of criticized for their um, immoderate intensity or like exaggerated, like, taken taken to excess. Yeah, I think I'd just add as well. I mean, so so I guess that discourse of um, a corpulent body being being well to do or rich, um, it, it's a very kind of masculine um, uh, uh, kind of uh, prototype in a sense. So you know, it makes you think the traditional example, I guess, in in England is is the portraits of Henry VIII. You know, who's who's you know very overweight, well to do, eats a lot, enjoys his life. That's exactly the discourse that we're, we're meant to get out of that. That same discourse you get in portraits of Hellenistic rulers. So these are kings. Um, of Egypt following the death of Alexander the Great, who were also frequently depicted as being really quite fleshy and, and well-to-do. And that translated across into some phases of Roman emperors who, you know, sometimes they were kind of slender and Greek and ideal and slim, like the early emperors. And then you get a round of emperors who were a bit like those Hellenistic rulers. They've got double chins and they've got eye bags and thick necks. And that that kind of oscillation of types goes all the way through Roman imperial portraiture. Um, so. I think that really um, leads to to this other question um, that one of our viewers had: um, How do modern ideas about unruly or undesirable bodies, um, such as fat, old, or ill bodies, affect the preservation and display of ancient statues with these bodies? Sort of. Um, to connect it more to kind of what Mark was just talking about, um, they do affect it um, a lot because often in a very unexamined way, we take um, sort of, we take up a lot of that discourse from antiquity and then apply it back to the object. And a great example of that um, is the portraiture of the emperor Nero. Um, he is a, a figure who is certainly in historical sources, you know, accused of all sorts of um, negative, like unquestionably a, a very disliked um, ruler who is historically been seen as responsible for everything, for, you know, burning Rome and all sorts of uh, immoral behavior on a personal um, as well as administrative level. And in his portraiture, Nero is distinct in showing himself on his coinage and in his portraits as as a fat man he you can 100% see that he is shown with like a very thick neck you know with a double chin and up until quite recently i mean even you know i remember when i was in high school it was perfectly okay to sort of just say like you know you can see in examples like this like what crazy you know, unstable man he was. And the unstated part was like, because who in their right mind would want to show themselves in this manner unless they were unwell? And this is a very much the kind of discourse that today we're trying to move away from. And um, I know in the UK, there was recently an exhibition on Nero at, at the British Museum that caused a lot of um, controversy precisely because it started poking at some of these things where, you know, to what extent are we continuing others' projections of um, certain behavior back onto the objects themselves? And so as we're talking about ways to, to display these objects in, in museum spaces and, you know, broadly in, in scholarship, we really have to kind of step back and, and re-examine, like, what exactly counts as as negative and is there anything on the object that that warrants that interpretation for the public 
And I, you know, I, I think a, a very basic answer to that question is, is absolutely yes. And I mentioned the research that I'd done in Rome and um, some of the most interesting things by far were actually sort of buried away in a basement and not displayed at all. Or they were in rooms that were closed off to the public, so the public weren't particularly interested. So I think there are lots of assumptions that are feeding into the way these, um, uh, you know, the, the way these statues are, are selected and displayed. Um, uh, Wesley is asked, um, it appears in some of these sculptures that musculature is strongly emphasised and not at all adipose fat tissue. And I think that's absolutely right. But, you know, you, you get that weary Hercules on the right on the slide here and you make him, you stop, you stop, you know, slunching over. You make him stand upright, throwing the knee and lying around. Uh, all of that, you know, what looks like kind of flabby muscle, it becomes real muscle, right? So it's not just about, you know, the, the tissue that the body has on it, but it's how the body is, what the body's doing, how it's posed. Um, and, and that just makes an enormous difference then to how, how you associate, what you associate that fleshiness with. Um, uh, but it's, you know, the artists, the, these artists are really clever. They know exactly what they're doing when they're sculpting particular kinds of, of poses. Um, I think um, there's a question that um, uh, Bonnie asks about um, thinness. Was was being very thin and fit ever admired? Um, this is something that um, I think your your article um, really spoke about um, wonderfully. That uh, thinness is very much a modern concept as an as a positive thing that the, the primary kind of connotations of thinness in in classical antiquity and in many pre-modern societies was as you know a step on a kind of rolling scale that leads towards wasting away and towards death and often you know this um idea that a thin body is desirable is not like a, an actual sort of what we would today consider an underweight body is desirable is not present in the written sources or in the artistic sources. But what is, I think, true is that even though it is undesirable, you don't see it as like nowhere nearly as criticized as the overweight bodies are. Like it's not that writers are sort of spending, you know, pages and pages going on about how you know, inappropriate or, or, you know, morally wrong, um, thin bodies are. So why do you think that opposite extreme wasn't as, as viciously, um, critiqued? I suppose, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about the, the famous Farnese Hercules, which is a sort of, you know, not, it's not, it's not slouched over in the way that we've got, got here, but he's, you know, he's the kind of bodybuilder. It's, you know, he's larger than life. It's a colossal statue. It's found in the baths of Caracalla, where people are not only bathing, but exercising. Uh, and in a sense, it's easy to, to fall into the interpretation that um, um, this is a, a kind of, you know, bodybuilder aesthetic that people in the baths of Caracalla are meant to look at. These Romans are meant to look at and say, I want a body like that. But actually, what's really interesting about how that that statue works in that context is it becomes a talking point because you know that bodies like that are not straightforwardly positive or straightforwardly negative but in a sense there's, there's a sort of aspirational element to it there's also a bit of a warning actually that you know if you know anything about Hercules he 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 comes to a sticky end and things go downhill so I, I think um you know rather than talking about um, images of, of um, thin or or, or, um, or or fat figures being either positive or negative. I think what what's really um, interesting is to see how the, the, those sculptural types open up a conversation. Uh, and I think we can see the baths, Roman baths, as being a place where you know clever people sit and they have conversations. Yeah, do you want to look like that? Why do you want to look like that? What are the consequences of looking like that? Mm -hmm. So I think that's broadly what I'd, what I'd say in response to that, which I think answers one or two of the other questions that I saw on the list. Bodies in art that were meant to be mocked, and does that align with body shaming today? I, I think so, actually. I, I think there were some uh, figures that were 
uh, were, were meant to be the subject of, of humour and comedy. And we talked about images of comic actors in fat suits, and that, that is an obvious context in which that, that kind of body shaming takes place. Um, when we get to uh, Hellenistic art, that's Hellenistic art is, is, is art around the 4th, 3rd century BC, um, there, there's a lot more provocative playfulness with bodies, bodies that are not don't fit the kind of classical ideal, um, emaciated old women kind of crouching down or, um, you know, there's, there's more emphasis on um, satyrs, those half men, half goats with pot bellies, which, you know, in a certain context, that, that's what you expect, but they're, they're meant to be kind of looked at and, and, and derided. And there, were, there was a whole brand of Greek plays called satyr plays, where it was about looking at what the world looks like if you turn the world upside down and stop behaving like normal people and and part of that is 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 drunken behavior and letting your body go so i think there's all sorts of examples where um you know body shaming is 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 one way of interpreting what's going on um our our next question is um an interesting one uh does the attitude towards um corpulence differ between roman and greek culture presumably the roman enterprise of conquest would have elevated fitness um does it differ between cultures um, the short answer is yes however the cultures themselves go on for centuries are very complicated uh, go on you know there are changes that happen however there are um we could point to um the existence even within antiquity uh of certain stereotypes where particular cultures are stereotypically perceived as um kind of fatter or heavier like bigger and a great example would be this sort of ancient trope of the obese etruscan um which is a kind of long-standing kind of trope that has sort of been taken up in scholarship as well because we have a couple of mentions of etruscans as being sort of obesus etruscus um is is kind of a a, a, a set phrase that does not actually mean that the Etruscan people were obese. And, you know, scholarship has gone to the point of actually performing very complicated, you know, bioarchaeological testing on Etruscan, you know, funerary remains to sort of show like that there is no, as far as we can tell, indication that this population was fatter or less fat than any other um, ancient population. However, a lot of these stereotypes, as is the case today, come about through complex processes where they are linked with all sorts of other um, negatively charged behaviors or appearances. And in the case of Etruscans, that's probably also the case. Now, um, as for the issue of Romans and conquest, the question of fitness is, is an interesting one because, you know, fitness is very different from your the the appearance of your body you can be a very i mean if you look at the the range of bodies represented in different athletic disciplines today vast majority of them are fit and yet they kind of end up looking different they have some are very slender some are very heavy how this would correlate with roman ideas about conquest is is hard to say but we can for sure say that there were um, anxieties, gendered anxieties about the appearance of bodies on the military battlefield. And one way that um, we see this is um, you can still see that um, today in representations of emperors and generals that wear these bronze breastplates that are then, you know, in, in marble sculpture, they are shown in marble. And the bronze breastplates are sculpted as if they were kind of shaped to this, you know, chiseled, um, you know, six pack abs, you kind of well defined pectorals, and you could, you know, they have nipples indicated and very much kind of create the illusion that this bronze was just cast, you know, over the body directly onto the body itself. Often this has led to people saying like, well, they must have been that fit underneath. 
but you can say the exact opposite that much like the fat suits are a costume that you can put on to kind of take on a different kind of body than the one you have this bronze plus breastplate makes you seem to others or makes you, you seem to yourself to kind of inhabit this kind of polyclidian ideal in a very literal way you kind of you put on the body that you want to have and it sort of shows you in a kind of photoshopped way either to others or perhaps even to yourself so this is something that we do not see in the same extent with any kind of um uh tropes of, of female portraiture and because it appears in military context is probably linked to gendered expectations on the battlefield yeah i just want to add to that as well those those are bc truscans one thing they all have in common is they're all dead right they're all in the afterlife they're relaxing they're enjoying life that's that's sort of you know that that's in place when you're when you're enjoying the afterlife living etruscans in in um etruscan uh, funerary arts they're all quite thin they're warriors they're you know that so they're active so even in etruscan art it's really quite complicated and as i said yet there are kind of rhythms and differences between different cultures but actually what what each phase historical phase has in common is is within every context, there's always a, um, a, a kind of bilateral interpretation. There's a double interpretation. Um, uh, as I said earlier, you know, you can have successful military emperors conquering the world, and they're all thin like Augustus and his successors. And then you have an, another regime, and they're all they're all beefy. And both of them are, uh, you know, they're, 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 they want to project that uh, association with, with um, you know, successful conquest and, and uh, imperialism. Carl has asked something about, and I may have misunderstood the question, so is there a potential conflict at looking at fat Venus figurines as inherently fertility-based? Same goes with Venus. Not to say each identical figure was um, a... Um, an IRL woman, but fertility elides the reality of fat bodies. So mm -hmm. I think, Carl, if I understand you there, I mean, what is interesting is that, you know, it's very old fashioned view that you look at a, a, a depiction of a, um, a, a large female figure, particularly in prehistoric faces, and see it as a depiction of, um, you know, female fertility and, and procreation. Actually, we've got no idea what those inflated female figurines from Europe actually meant, what they were used for, what the associations were. And they're actually called Venus figures, like the Venus of Willendorf. They're called it ironically because they look so different from traditional um, uh, depictions of, of Venus in classical art. So I think we should be cautious. We're looking at classical art here, and ambiguity is our key theme. I think we should be cautious about associating uh, fleshiness and fertility straightforwardly in any artistic context, actually. And I think that is um, sort of what the... the um question really put so um succinctly that fertility elides the reality of of fat bodies i think that is precisely kind of why we wanted to have a program like this to say that yes the fertility aspect in you know the case of you know childbearing um individuals is a is a real thing like there are certain kind of there is a certain threshold of body fat below which you do not menstruate and you kind of a procreation and fertility in the literal sense is sort of linked to to kind of how to the body fat percentage in a way that is not as far as i understand cultural but um it is true that like to simply kind of consider any female reading body that is in any way curvier or bigger as being inherently about fertility that's precisely the easy cop-out answer that you know you could apply to anything and by kind of unpacking this more and looking at it as an as an artistic problem it gets us away from kind of these sort of simplistic readings of like fertility as a, as a kind of catch-all that that answers any questions and really makes us sort of um, confront the situation that the sculptor who represented the Venus like this could have and maybe did represent her also in those kind of much more standardized standing poses. But this one offered something 
artistically interesting that was appealing um, as a pose in its own right. And that's a separate question from a kind of fertility aspect that might have been culturally um, emphasized. And perhaps just briefly to add to that and to pick up um, uh, one or two of the other questions in the chat about the pose of this crouching Venus. Somebody asked, um, can you say something about the the, spi- the spiraling movement, the twisting movement of the, of the crouching Venus? That We've got lots and lots and lots of these and they're, they're copies of a, an earlier prototype. But every time you copy them, it's not just like creating a plastic cast and just to look exactly the same. They're, they change subtly every time a sculptor wants to reproduce this. So they're, they're twisting more. She's bending over more. She's got a different pose. And, you know, actually counting the number of fleshy folds um, uh, is really interesting. As time goes on, when you get to a, there's a very famous one in the Villa of Hadrian at Tivoli, and I think there are like, um, you know, something like six or seven folds, which is more than you've ever had before. Um, that you know, every time you depict this Venus, you do something a bit different with it, and every time you do something different, you're conveying a sort of different type of interpretation. So there's a sort of you know shifting discourse over time about what this means. Well, I think um, it's time to to wrap up, but um, before before we leave, I wanted to just um, say a very very big thank you, Mark, for for joining me and and having this discussion, and um, thank you all. Um, viewers and um, to everyone who has submitted questions. We encourage you to check out um, the Google Digital exhibition on this topic that brings in a lot more um, material, many more objects from from the Getty's collections. And uh, you can visit getty.edu for information about upcoming programs and to see what's on. Thank you all once again very much.